Hello, and welcome to the Gallimorphy, a podcast about history. I'm Will, and with me, as always, is my co-host Nick. How are you doing today, Nick? Hello there. I, I'm doing fine, if not a little bit frozen. Yes, it seems to be snowing again today. Um, I don't know what it is about our recording days. Apparently the beast from the East too is upon us. But hopefully everyone's ears haven't frozen off, because this week we're going to be covering a very interesting topic. And to get you going, here's our audio cue. This is on. Good becoming moderate or poor. So, if you've received that clearly, uh, you probably know that this episode we're going to be discussing the origins of broadcast radio. Yes, today's topic is the wireless, the squawk box, the hi-fi, the ham, or simply the radio. I'm, I'm going to skip the radio voice. I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. Uh, now, just before we start, we should probably explain what radio is. Basically, radio is an electromagnetic wave. Think of a ripple on a pond, sort of fluctuating up and down. Um, but they are a type of radiation, which is why scientists are always, you know, pointing radio telescopes at stars. Yes, that was uh, that was quite well described, actually. Um, I, th- I think if you want to see a good analogy, I think the the opening to the film Contact kind of kind of shows that as well, doesn't it? But, uh, they could just watch Contact instead of listening to this. Yeah, oh, yeah exactly. Um, okay, yeah. we're done. Oh well, that was fun. Cool. What's next week? Uh, <laughs> next week we're going to talk about dinosaur theme parks. Oh, well, well, that's sorted as well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, so radio isn't just that thing on your car dashboard. It's actually one of the um, the most significant developments of the last 150 years. Everything we use to communicate today is basically a radio wave. So mobile phones, baby monitors, hotspots, wireless technology, all of these use radio waves to communicate. Yeah, so it's it's kind of the groundwork that uh, modern communication is really based on. But the roots of it go all the way back to the mid-19th century. Communication by uh, electric telegraphy um, originates around the 1830s, and that uh, relied on there being a cable between two points to communicate. Uh, this was pretty good for the time, but it was obviously quite restricting, especially uh, when it came to things like ship to shore. Um, you couldn't run a cable really kind of practically between uh, the shore and a boat just to communicate. You've clearly never seen those like uh, uh, cu- cups attached to string from tree houses to houses. Could they not have just done that? I didn't think of that. No, maybe maybe they should have. But yes, believe it or not, there was a time when, when people were thinking that maybe a piece of string with two cups was, was slightly limiting uh, and, and they should look at other options. So to really uh, discuss the origins of radio, we need to go back and and look at the discovery of radio waves themselves. This one's kind of hard to kind of point to one particular individual. There's a whole host of characters who are involved, but uh, let's just go over a few of them and and discuss sort of their contributions to the field. It really was like a very global effort to sort of achieve the discovery of electromagnetism and the discovery of radio waves, and then subsequently, you know, the creation of radio itself. In fact, there are English people, Scottish people, Brazilian, French, Indian, Serbian, American, Italian, German. I mean, I could go on. And that's because, you know, the world is getting smaller. Uh, Technology is advancing. You have the invention of the telephone and the telegraph already, which are wired communications. But also, people just have more time to experiment and tinker. In the case of radio, it really starts with the idea of a of electricity and magnetism and electromagnetism. So in 1802, you have this Italian called... By the way, this is going to be a, a cavalcade of terrible pronunciations. When is it not? Thank you, Will. Yeah. <laughs> so in 1802, you have Juan Domenico Romanosi, who, pos- who posited that there was a relationship between electricity and magnetism. He was promptly ignored <laughs> by the scientific community. And then in 1820... A uh, tall, handsome Danish man comes along called Hans Christian Verstead, uh, and he experimented with a wire and a current showing it could detect a compass needle. And that was real, really the first example of the relationship between electricity and magnetism being connected. And then after that, you have a, a few more individuals sort of building on that work. But the real sort of man credited with discovering the various types of science around electromagnetism, like induction, was Michael Faraday. He built on the experiments of Erstad 
and it, it was really in 1831 that Faraday discovered something key, which was electromagnetic induction after proposing that a current flowing in one wire could induce a current in another wire that were not physically touching. And then in 1845, after years of experiments, he proved the existence of a whole host of electromagnetic fields. It's probably also important to note at this point that these experiments weren't radio as we know it. It wasn't uh, audio or, or messages being sent. It was, uh, it, they were more like blips, weren't they? Um, just little bursts. I mean, at, at this stage, it's literally just electricity. Mm. And then after this, you have James Clark Maxwell. And he spotted that electromagnetic waves and a varying magnetic field could induce a varying electric field and vice versa, uh, which basically suggested that uh, electricity could travel at the speed of light. Mm. And this was big, not just for the, the topics we're looking at, but also sort of in the fields of um, uh, astronomy um and and physics this idea that that radio waves traveled at, at the speed of light no I exactly and it just led to more tinkering and more tinkering with scientists and i'm skipping over a lot of people here which i apologize <laughs> to the history books but then in, in 1880 you have this uh guy who was part of the royal society in london called david edward hughes and it's suggested he might have transmitted the first radio waves after he sparked one of his electrical devices and overheard it in a nearby microphone. Uh, but everyone else convinced him it was just electromagnetic induction. So a lot of the early devices where people were experimenting, trying to transmit not just electricity, but sounds, depended on these machines, which were spark machines. And they generate basically a series of brief pulses, which are called dampened waves. And they're enabled to produce continuous waves, which is what we're, what we're doing now, what you're listening to. Uh, and these pulses were then assigned, you know, letters by the telegraph operators, and that's where you get Morse code and telegraphy from. And then after David Edward Hughes had done this, Temistocle Calzecchi Onesti invented what would later turn out to be the sort of first radio detector, where he just put a bunch of metal fillings in a glass tube inside an electric circuit. And then a French guy called Edouard Branly built an improved version of this in 1890, which is a device that would sort of later go on to be quite useful to Marconi. For Marconi, there is one person that finally manages to discover radio waves themselves. So that guy is a guy called Heinrich uh, Rudolf Hertz. That's a name you may be familiar with. Uh, at least you should be familiar with his surname. He later proved Maxwell's experiments. Um, and this form of electromagnetic radiation was called Hertzian waves after him. Uh, he discovered that a wire carrying an electric current will radiate electromagnetic radiation or radio waves. And this was the sort of beginnings of the, the antenna. If you're not familiar with the term Hertz, uh, it's a unit of measurement um, and it's used to measure uh, frequency or cycles per second. Um, you might be familiar with it when, um, if you if you're sort of into TVs or, or computer games, uh, monitors are uh, their refresh rates are measured in hertz, and that's how many times it is um, the picture is refreshed per second. Well, the weird thing about what Hertz discovered, but he was the first man to intentionally show radio waves existed. However, he didn't see any practical purpose for this discovery. He just just thought, oh, I've I've found this out, can't really do much with it. Uh, but Q Nikolai Tesla, not the car, the man who invented the Tesla coil, which was basically a sort of radio frequency oscillator and resonance transformer. And I say basically, that's actually quite complex. But essentially, it's a little little metal coil that generates high voltage electricity at a very low current, which was, you know, groundbreaking. He wasn't aiming to create a source uh, to transmit sound. He was aiming to use his coils to create a source of lighting using radio waves because radio waves are a source of light light is an electromagnetic wave in many ways he was way ahead of his time he um he had this idea that he wanted to supply power to the world without wires and this is before you know uh, electricity of the home was <laughs> a normal thing like it is today even even before that he he had this idea. He he was never able to really achieve it. Yeah, it was obviously really brilliant, but he, he was just terrible at um kind of selling his ideas. 
he was able, using his Tesla coil, he was able to uh, emit radio waves that could travel up to 50 kilometers, which is way further than uh, people have managed to up until then. So he was really, he was really on it at the time. Sadly, Marconi, um, somebody we're going to be talking about quite shortly, was working on the same technology at the time and was able to beat Tesla to it. Yeah, in fact, there were there are a number of colourful, interesting characters across the world working on this problem at once. Uh, in fact, one of them was called Nathan Beverly Stubblefield, who was a Kentucky farmer. And uh, according to one of the sources I read, between 1885 and 1892, he was said to develop radio. And in 1902, he demonstrated a battery-operated wireless telephone using induction transmission rather than radio transmission. Uh, he ended up becoming a recluse uh, and lived in a, a sort of shack near the Alamo. Uh, and his body was discovered in 1928, being gnawed by rats. But the citizens of the local town of Murray dubbed him the father of radio. So That's, that's kind of what we're saying, though. There, there are so many uh, players involved in this that it's really hard just to point at, at one person as being the, the creator of radio. There were... Lots of uh, lots of kind of different contributions, lots of things happening at the same time. Yeah, there, I mean, there was a Brazilian called Roberto Landel de Moura who demonstrated wireless transmission in 1900. And then one of my favorites is there's an Indian physicist called Chandra Bose who did it even earlier in 1894 in, in Calcutta by setting fire to gun to gunpowder uh, and ringing a bell using the waves. I, I think it's really nice, you know, that this this idea this. It was so it was such a game changer and it, but it, so many people involved in it so and that brings us finally to uh guillermo marconi uh probably the most famous uh contributor to the field of radio at least during this period um guillermo marconi he was italian his mother was irish though and he came to live in england as a sort of young man i think he was in his 20s he is credited generally as the guy who started it all. Actually, another interesting fact about Marconi, he's he's related to the founder of Jameson Whiskey. Yeah, he began experimenting in 1894 in, in Bologna, in Italy, which is where he's from. He basically stuck a bunch of tin plates on posts as receivers for a telegraph system and started experimenting. No one in Italy liked this and told him to stop, so he, he, uh, <laughs> he got invited over to England by, weirdly enough, the British Post Office who are very keen to advance new technology in the service of their industry. Oh, how times have changed. Um, and by 1896, he had constructed a transmitter on the central telegraph office, which had a range of 12 kilometers, uh, and then later demonstrated radio waves at Toynbee Hall. In 1897, he started his own company called the Wireless Telegraph and Signal Company. And they just, they just started experimenting, sending messages across water because that was the next big thing. So anyone who's familiar with the Isle of Wight, as I'm sure there are many of you, you might be familiar with the Marconi Monument uh, at Allen Bay near the Needles. This commemorates uh, Marconi's work on the island. Uh, he came to the Isle of Wight in December 1897 to investigate and experiment with transmissions to ships at sea. And it's here where he received the first ship-to-shore transmission. Enough about the Isle of Wight, if that's even possible. There's so much to talk about. Marconi actually then... After his successful ship-to-shore transmission, uh, he went on in 1901 to make the first transatlantic radio message. Uh, he sent the letter S in Morse code from Poldu in Cornwall, and it was picked up in Newfoundland in Canada. Yes, that was a monumental monumental achievement for Marconi. Uh, basically, he did it by mounting six huge kites, which are held aloft on this 180-metre stretch of wire these huge towers so it must have been quite the sight and it, it took a while for uh, <laughs> to actually achieve this because the weather both in newfoundland and in cornwall which the other the other base was based in just they, they everything kept blowing down it's kind of kind of interesting really when you when you look at uh, guillermo's experiments uh he, he is such a huge figure in in the origins of radio and yet it all just seems so sort of haphazard like he seems like more of a, a shed tinkerer than uh, than a great inventor. Uh, well, that's the thing. Marconi even said he freely admitted to not understanding how it all worked, but he just wanted to make it work, yeah. and and that was the thing that drove. Yeah, him. and then he went on uh, in 1909 to win the Nobel Prize for his inventions. So, yeah. well, he actually he actually won a joint Nobel Prize. He shared it with uh, with Carl Ferdinand Braun, 
who actually had two major contributions to radio because uh, he introduced a closed tuned circuit which created a separation from the antenna to the circuit and then in 1898 he discovered a crystal diode which helped increase the distance of radio transmission so they were they were in in the same field there was me thinking he invented the electric toothbrush <laughs> i think you're thinking of the razor <laughs> Isn't Braun? No. Does Braun do toothbrushes? No. That, no, it does razors. I'm thinking Oral B. <laughs> that's what you're I'm thinking, thinking of. I'm thinking of Carl um, Oral B. But just, <laughs> before we skip to 1909, um, this, this, this transatlantic uh, event was monumentous because it basically proved to everyone that this thing could work. And after that, you started having uh, ships and lighthouses having equipment installed in them which could transmit these these clicks with these morse codes um and basically if if this hadn't been invented and it hadn't been on board the titanic so many more lives would have been lost when the titanic sunk and we might never have we might never know what happened to it because that technology existed on board the ship to transmit uh to transmit at long range yeah there's a there's quite a famous scene from the film um a night to remember uh, which is from about the sinking of the Titanic of the, um, the telegraph operator kind of frantically sending out messages as the ship sinks. While this is all going on and while it's actually being used, you know, obviously to communicate with ships as a service, no one actually saw the potential for radio to be a sort of broadcast device. It was uh, it's, it, Even Marconi, he didn't see any use for it. Well, I guess one of the main problems that people had was that you, <laughs> the early radio transmissions weren't, as we said, they weren't voices. They were basically a bunch of people making sparky noises at each other which spelled out letters so to convey voices or music you needed what was called a continuous wave transmitter so enter another great dane uh called valdemir pulsen who invented an arc converter in 1903 it meant that instead of transmitting just sort of sparky noises you could attach a microphone to equipment and transmit voices so this is sort of what led to the the old um crystal radio sets with the cat's whisker they were very, very early radios, uh, and they used a small crystal and a little antenna, but they were very, very low power, and you had to have uh, headphones to listen to them. And, and just to clarify, we're all talking about AM currently. FM doesn't actually exist yet. Uh, and interestingly, in terms of speech as the way we know it, the first ever recorded transmission across the Atlantic was uh, actually an engineer called Adam Stein in 1906. And basically his conversation at Brant Rock, Massachusetts was overheard all the way in England in Plymouth at testing station. And these stations were built at the behest of Reginald Fessingdon, who is this Canadian-American inventor. And he had developed a high-frequency alternator transmitter of his own, which was in direct competition to Marconi. And then later on, the success of that, in Christmas of 1906, he made what would be the first, I guess you could term it, international broadcast. Uh, because he broadcast from Massachusetts to all the ships on the Atlantic seaboard. He sent a telegraph ahead uh, going, tune in to this. And then uh, he basically spoke to them a bit saying what he was doing, what this broadcast was about. And then he played a recording of Handel's Largo, played the violin. And then it, there was supposed to be a reading from Adam Stein himself. <laughs> and then also Fessenden's wife, who's supposed to read the Bible. But they both got mic fright. So it's probably the first recorded moment of, of mic fright. <laughs> So he ended up just doing it all himself and thanking everyone and wishing them a Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, again, he, he really comes across as, as one of these sort of um, eccentric tinkerers. The fact that it, it's this sort of monumental broadcast to ships across the Atlantic and he, he plays his violin for them. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I mean, it's really nice, but it's just like it doesn't seem like the obvious thing for your first great broadcast. He'd, he'd have been bigger with the TikTok crowd if he'd done sea shanties. Yes, that's very, it's very relevant. Yeah. We're, we're, we're down with the kids. We can uh, we can look forwards as well as backwards. I mean, I look mostly sideways. Mm. Never know where I'm going. Well, that that kind of um, suspicious glance you give people, that's a bit sideways. So speaking of uh, early musical performances over radio, uh, we come to Lee Forest, who was another sort of um, kind of radio pioneer of the time. Um, and he is notable for uh, broadcasting the first live performance from an opera, 
which he did in 1910 at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. Uh, he, he strung microphones throughout the building uh, and used it to record a performance of Tosca. He wasn't entirely happy with the results at the time, feeling sort of slightly constrained by the technology, so didn't return and try again until 1916 when the technology had progressed enough. Leader Forrest himself was, as you mentioned, was, was a bit of a character. He um, is considered in America one of the sort of pioneers of radio as well. But it was actually another American he, he actually got into quite a few legal battles with called Edwin Howard Armstrong, who also had quite a major impact on radio. In fact, he invented not one, but three electric circuits that formed the basis of, of TV, radio and even radar, even today. Uh, so in 1914, he painted a regenerative circuit, which enabled greater amplification, meaning you no longer needed headphones. You could play it through a loudspeaker. Because before, up until now, people would be massive headphones on so they could hear the clicking of the sparks or even the waves of voices. But now you could play it through a speaker, which is pretty cool. Uh, then during the war, he developed the super heterodyne receiver, making them even more sensitive and selective to frequencies. Um, and this this was the actually the invention he became uh, embroiled in a patent war with De Forest over. Um, he ultimately lost. But while this was happening, he actually discovered something called super regeneration, where he discovered that by rapidly what he called quenching the valve oscillations, he could achieve even more amplification. So so serendipity, he discovered something even better uh, in, in an effort to sort of prove his case against De Forest. But his greatest achievement was creating FM radio. Oh yes, wideband frequency modulation, as it's as it was known then. Yeah. So anyone who uh, was familiar with local radio uh, before it was all absorbed by Hart um, <laughs> is, is probably familiar with um, FM. Um, for us, it was ninety-eight point four FM, the Eagle. Going back a bit, this development in, in, in audio amplification, which allowed um, radios to play through a loudspeaker, is, is kind of what took radio from something which uh, you listen to by yourself through a pair of headphones to something which you would enjoy with your family. The very beginnings of people, rather than taking their family out to the theatre or to see um, the variety shows which were popular at the time, people would stay home. Yeah, you're absolutely right loudspeaker changed the way people consumed radio and with fm radio that changed it even more because it, it made am radio was a bit scratchy it wasn't really that great and fm radio was a lot clearer but that didn't come in until i mean he patented it in the 1930s and really it wasn't until 1940 that that kicks off which is a bit beyond the area we're looking at, at the moment but it's it's important to mention how much of a contribution he made and unfortunately he has kind of a sad ending because um he ended up in lots more legal battles. He ended up hitting his wife in a fit of rage, so she'd left him. And basically, this led to him jumping off a building in 1954. So he didn't have a happy ending. But his wife, despite suffering the abuse, carried on his legal battles and eventually won 10 million in damages. Oh, well, I suppose that's something at least, isn't it? Returning back to transmission, back to just after the First World War. So Marconi's experiments had sort of been on, put on pause and everything was directed to the war effort. But by 1918, he was up and running again. And we've had the first Atlantic transmission in 1906. But now in 1918, Marconi succeeded in transmitting the first European voice the other way. This used a new valve transmitter developed by Alexander Meisner in Germany in 1913. Uh, and it basically reduced the amount of power that you needed to transmit over long distances. So it greatly helped. After the war, Marconi started teaching people, giving courses, and, and gradually you had these enthusiasts building their own sets and setting up their own little stations. And gradually that entertainment aspect of how we've come to know radio was sort of taking hold. And then in 1918, at one point, you had nearly 20 stations transmitting speech and music to the London area alone. Their broadcast range wasn't huge, but, you know, that's pretty impressive. And there was one broadcaster, for instance, called Harry Walker, who would start his broadcasts of news and music with, this is Brentford calling. <laughs> so it's around this time uh, when radio, which had up until now been more of a, a hobbyist thing, 
uh, was starting to be something which uh, could be enjoyed by the masses, which had become more mainstream. And it is at this point, uh, on the 2nd of November 1920, that the first scheduled radio broadcast was started in Pittsburgh. Uh, it was a radio station which actually still exists. It's called KDKA, and it transmitted the Harding Cox presidential election results. And uh, who won? Uh, it was either Harding or Cox. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, oh, it was. Uh, it was. It was Harding. <laughs> Harding. He won. He won about four times as many votes as Cox. I mean, we would know if there was a President Cox. It would be the butt of many a joke <laughs> for the last 60, 70 years. Yeah, interesting fact about uh, Warren G. Harding. He had darker eyebrows than hair. I'm sorry, that's all I'm getting. <laughs> that's a very broad definition of interesting there. Um, <laughs> he, he did. <laughs> well, whereas James N. Cox, um, he wore glasses which didn't have uh, the little bits that clip behind your ears. Uh, so this new medium of radio, <laughs> not everyone was keen to embrace it uh, or understand how it functioned. Was electromagnetism responsible for droughts and famine? Uh, was it causing, you know, infertility? Uh, and so skeptics blamed radios for the vibrations of bed springs, the creaking of floorboards, even children vomiting. It's, times never change. Really. They, ne they never do. It's just different clothes it, it's quite comforting really to know that um uh, today's skeptics are not you know they've always been there there's always been people of that particular mindset um i mean i i'd say i'm a bit skeptical about that but uh, uh yes so uh at this point radio has kind of hit its stride it's it's getting big it's mainstream people are buying radios they're they're being mass produced and it is this point where we see the beginnings of, I think it's fair to say, a British institution, the the BBC, which is formed in 1922 as the British Broadcasting Company. Originally, uh, it was a sort of joint effort among the various British radio manufacturers, uh, but eventually it was sort of nationalised and as the British Broadcasting Corporation that we know today. Uh, but yes, 1922, the BBC starts its first regular radio service. That's absolutely um, right, and it, it's off the back of our old friend Marconi setting up uh, uh, different radio stations throughout the country as well. And he was actually one of these sort of part, part of the group, rather, of the, the founders of the BBC, as it was a group of leading wireless manufacturers who sort of came together and helped form it. But, but weirdly enough, uh, the broadcasts, although they spread quite quickly, because you had the advent of radio with the loudspeaker we've mentioned from, from Armstrong, and radios were beginning to be sold commercially, they didn't really kick off until 1926 when the newspapers went on strike and so at that point the radio leapt leapt into action and became the leading source of information for the public and we've sort of never looked back until we get to tv yeah so it's at this point the mid-1920s um most of the british population uh owned a radio and could receive the bbc and that's mm. kind of a real tipping point there it's like yeah, radio has really arrived at this point, at least in Britain, uh, you know, obviously several years earlier in America. That essentially is sort of the origin of radio, this sort of weird winding sort of past the parcel between engineers and inventors until eventually we get to the medium we know and love. And, and from this point on, it just sort of explodes and, and it leads to things like television, which hopefully you're familiar with. And then from there, we have things like DAB, and, you know, you could kind of draw all these strands going off in all different directions. It was just such a sort of monumental, huge uh, innovation in technology that had such massive effects on society. Let's move on. Uh, why don't we discuss some interesting facts that we found during our research for this podcast? Well, there are actually quite a lot of interesting facts, but my interesting fact was Marconi was such a huge figure and, and I think that's something to remember each sort of country has a person that sort of spent their life researching radio and developing radio and, and they're important to them so in America you have your your leader forests your Edwin Armstrongs in the U UK you have your Marconis 
And what I found interesting was that when Marconi died, and he died in 1937, so he lived a fair old lick, such was his legacy. On the day of his funeral, all the British Broadcasting Corporation stations were silent for two minutes in tribute to his contribution to the development of the radio. But so uh, what was your interesting fact, Will? So my interesting fact is uh, about AM radio waves. So normally AM radio waves, because of the way that radio waves move in a straight line, uh, the, the maximum reach is normally about 40 miles because that's the point where the curvature of the Earth means that it sort of falls away. But um, around the Earth, there is uh, the ionosphere, which is the uh, ionised part of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, ionised just means um, that because of the uh, the sun, uh, atoms in this um, ionosphere uh, lose their electrons and turn into ions. But this ionosphere, it has a tendency to bounce radio waves. So if the AM radio waves hit it at the right angle, it can bounce between the ionosphere and the ground. At night, though, uh, the sun's effect is less, so it becomes more reflective. So there are records of uh, AM radio waves traveling thousands of miles around the world to places where they they really weren't intended to go to. Um, There's one incident, uh, it relates to TV, but it's the same technology. Uh, In 1938, a BBC transmission from Alexandra Palace was picked up 3,000 miles away at RCA on the east coast of America. And these guys, they, they actually made a recording of this. And because the BBC were not particularly interested in archiving material in those days. It is now the, the earliest known recording uh, of a BBC broadcast. Well, that was truly amazing. And I mean that most sincerely. Uh, now, uh, do you have any myths, Will? So my myth is um, there's an idea these days that uh, radio is um, a dying um, a dying media. Um, that video did, in fact, kill the radio star. <laughs> but um, I've been waiting for you, waiting for you to I get know, that. The one whole in episode, I've been thinking, where I've got to squeeze this in somewhere. Where can I put it? And here we go. So, um, but uh, a recent Nielsen study, uh, this was in America, of radio listenership, found that the biggest group of people who were listening to radio still were actually millennials, uh, people aged between 18 and 34. So, of 243 million Americans. Uh, polled 66.6 million of them were millennials and these were uh, Americans who actively listened to the radio but it's an interesting uh, little sort of bit of data there that that our generation uh, who are defined by growing up around the internet and the millennium uh, have actually turned out to be the, the biggest radio listeners at least in this study yeah we're also the generation of the hipster I don't know if that's got something to do with it it's sort well, of, um... on, on the topic of hipsters. Ah. So, <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> my, my myth is that we, we know we talked about Lee DeForest broadcasting opera and obviously uh, Fessingen broadcasting his violin playing. Um, so, some sites will tell you that that's actually the first broadcast of music in radio history. Technically, technically, before it was cool, there was someone who did it first. That was an Austrian fellow named Otto. Nussbaumer, who yodeled an Austrian folk song up to 22 metres in distance in June 1904. So that's our show about the origins of broadcast radio. I'm sure we could carry on for hours, but we've got to stop it somewhere. We could be talking for hours. There's, there's so much to do on radio and so much more to explore. Next week, we're going to be talking about the Berlin blockade or the Berlin airlift which was basically the first major international crunch point after the Second World War between the US and the Soviet Union. So I, I guess we'll star see you next time. <laughs> it's all I've got. I can't be on any other puns. As always, it's been a pleasure uh, to, to be able to speak to you all. Uh, if you'd like to speak back to us, please do feel free to get in touch. Uh, you can email us at info at uh, You can also visit our website at thegallimorphery.show. And you can find us on Spotify. Oh, oh, wait, wait. What's that? you got I've one. I've got one. What have you got? I've got one. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully next time you'll be rushing back to see us. It was worth the wait.
worth the wait and worth yeah. interrupting me where was i <laughs> yes so uh we're on the all the usual uh podcast channels uh find us on spotify apple podcasts google podcasts stitcher if you know what that happens to be we're everywhere so please subscribe and listen and join us next time take care